going on guys i'm gonna talk to you today about not the korean war but world war ii so youtubers you talk about world war ii because this is the actually the first time america uh freed korea they did not fight any direct battles on korean soil during this time but japan occupied korea from 1910 to 1945 so that is why September 15th, when Japan officially surrendered, they have Korean Liberation Day here in Korea. And I've talked about that holiday before. But anyway, I'm going to talk to you about that. Okay, we talked about the Battle of Luzon. This is where America freed the Philippines from Japanese occupation. Okay, and this was a key battle because the Philippines were 2,500 miles south of Japan. And they had a lot of communications lines there. When Japan took the Philippines from the U.S. There were a lot of key, they set up a lot of key communications networks. And if the U.S. took the Philippines, then the communications network between Japan and their territory south of the Philippines, the communications network would be severed. The communications network between Japan and the Japanese held islands south of the Philippines, the communications would be severed. So, on January 6, 1945, 850 ships from the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet came to the Philippines, and most of the soldiers that fought on the ground were from the 6th U.S. Arm, the 6th U.S. Army. Okay, now, okay, the island that they took, the first island that the U.S. took from Japan is the island of Luzon. The island of Luzon was home to the Philippines capital city of Manila, and also Clark Airfield, okay, and Clark Airfield was a key air base. Okay, Japan had 250,000 soldiers on the Philippines. Okay, they're divided into three groups, the Shobu, the Kambu, and the Shimbu group. Okay, and they were commanded by Tamayuki Yamashita. He was the commander of the Japanese forces. Okay, there were, okay, the United States, they get to the Philippines. When they land in the Philippines, they are landed uncontested. The Japanese did not fire. They decided to let the United States move about 20 or 30 miles inland inside the Philippines. And then they fire on the U.S. soldiers after they get a little bit inside. And this happened at Clark Airfield. The United States get to Clark Airfield, and the Japanese are camouflaged very well in the hills behind Clark Airfield. Their tanks, their um, cannons, they're all they're all scout. They're all camouflaged very, very well at Clark Airfield, at the hills behind Clark Airfield. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay. The, and the U.S. soldiers get to the pillboxes near Clark Airfield. The pillboxes are empty, but as soon as they exit those empty pillboxes, the Japanese soldiers from the higher hills, from the hills behind the pillboxes and behind Clark Airfield, they open up on them. They open their fire on them. They shoot at them. And the U.S. soldiers win that battle. Um, they kill 2,500 Japanese soldiers, 2,500 Japanese soldiers, and they take Clark Airfield. And when the U.S. took Clark Airfield, the U.S. could now, uh, the U.S. soldiers could have air support from the U.S. Army Air Corps. And so that was a key, uh, a key battle, a key, a key battle winning Clark Airfield. Okay, we talked, okay, we talked about that. Okay, after that, there were 511 American prisoners of war in Cabanatuan. Okay, Cabanatuan was in Japan, the Japanese-held territory of the Philippines. The Americans did not liberate Cabanatuan at this time. And the Japanese knew the Americans were about to, though. And uh, they unco the U.S. uncovered a Japanese document saying that in the event of an American invasion, so when the Americans invaded the Philippines, if they liberated a prisoner of war camp, that the Japanese soldiers were supposed to kill the American prisoners of war so the prisoners of war could not be free. Um, the Japanese told their soldiers to use poison or poison gas. It did not matter. So the American soldiers sent a special operations unit called the Alamo Scouts. And there was a photographer called Robert Lautman. He was with the U.S. Army Signal Corps. And he was assigned to be with the Alamo Scouts. And he said they were the nicest guys you will ever meet. They really believed in their mission. They really wanted to free the prisoners of war, the American prisoners of war. And also, the Alamo, the Alamo Scouts, they had help from the, the 
Filipino guerrillas. Okay, they were guerrilla fighters, Filipino guerrilla fighters that uh, disrupted a lot of Japanese soldiers and Japanese um, positions during Japan's occupation of the Philippines. Okay, and that happened. And so the Filipino scout guerrillas and the Alamo scouts they scouted the Japanese prisoner of war camp. Okay, and how they distracted them is a U.S. Army Air Corps P-61 Black Widow fighter flew above the prisoner of war camp. That distracted the Japanese soldiers. The Japanese soldiers shot at the fighter plane. Okay, and then a small group, a small number of soldiers in from the Alamo scouts, they moved to the southeast corner of the prisoner of war camp, not the main entrance. And they would distract the Japanese soldiers as well, fire from the southeast entrance. The northeast was the main entrance. As soon as they fired from the southeast entrance, the soldiers at the northeast entrance would come in and liberate the prisoner of war camp. And two U.S. Alamo scouts died in that battle. And two prisoners of war died from from disease. Um, they were already infected before the U.S. soldiers freed them. And the prisoners of war were only four or five years older than a lot of the Alamo scouts, but they looked about 20 or 30 years older. They had missing teeth, uh, amputated body limbs. It was just a, um, it was a horrible situation because the Japanese soldiers really treated them uh, badly in the prisoner of war camp. Um, and so the next step was the U.S. Soldiers had to liber had to liberate Manila, okay, the Manila, the capital city of the Philippines. At first, MacArthur did not allow uh, air support and he did not allow artillery support because there were many Filipino civilians held hostage in Manila. So that was going to accidentally kill a lot of Filipino civilians. And this was the only time uh, urban warfare happened in the Pacific Theater of World War II. The first and only time that urban warfare happened in the Filipino. That, that, sorry, got a little distracted right there. This was the only time that um, urban warfare, the first and only time that urban warfare happened in the Pacific Theater of World War II, okay? And before the U.S. soldiers went into Manila, um, MacArthur met with a bunch of them. He asked them their names. He asked them where they were from. And General MacArthur said, you're either going to be a hero or a dead body corpse. It all depends on you. So it was a lot of U.S. soldiers being carried by transport trucks, and they were going 50 miles an hour, about 80 kilometers per hour. And while they were driving really fast, the soldiers in the back of the truck were shooting at the Japanese soldiers. Okay. And then the Japanese commander of the Japanese commander in the city of Manila, Sanji Iwabuchi, he ignored orders to evacuate the city. So he fought the United States soldiers tooth and nail. Okay. The, 37th Infantry Division and the 1st Cavalry took took Manila. They invaded Manila from the north, the east, and the west. And the 11th Airborne Division landed in Nasugbu. Nasugbu. And they that was to the south of Manila. And they invaded Manila, Manila from the south. And the United States won that battle. And at first... The U.S. troops were not allowed artillery support, but the Japanese soldiers blew up bridges. They retreated, and when they retreated, they blew up a lot of bridges. So the U.S. soldiers had to use a lot of pontoon boats, okay? They had to use a lot of pontoon boats. And the Japanese soldiers shot a lot of U.S. soldiers on the pontoon boats. So MacArthur said, you can use artillery because the Japanese soldiers are shooting in a lot of you guys. And the 11th Airborne, the 11th Airborne Division... They fought the Japanese tooth and nail at Rizal Memorial Stadium. The Japanese turned that stadium into a battleground. They converted that stadium into a battleground. And it was scary going into that building and trying to kill the Japanese soldiers before they killed the U.S. soldiers. Um, it was basically like a maze of rooms. And it was the same thing with there was the 37th Infantry Division's invasion was held was stopped uh, when Japanese set up combat fortress at a police station. And they faced the same horror that the 11th Airborne Division faced. Going inside a building and with small rooms with the enemy shooting at you is a scary, scary situation. But these soldiers persisted. Um, they also, when they liberated Manila, they fed a lot of Filipino soldiers. And also Filipino women and children. Filipino women and Filipino children uh, with the food they had. The, the Filipino 
the Filipinos and the Filipinas in Manila were very, very happy to see the U.S. soldiers. And the, also the Filipino guerrillas, the freedom fighters inside the Philippines, they gave a, the U.S. prisoners of war that were freed from Banatuan, they gave them uh, ox carts to help get the U.S. soldiers to safety and away from Japanese-held territory. So God bless them. They're kind of like the unsung heroes of, they're definitely the unsung heroes of World War II. Okay. Uh, MacArthur really wanted to free the Bataan Peninsula and Corregidor, okay? And the invasion of Manila was halted until the U.S. soldiers could liberate Corregidor because Corregidor was a key held island that controlled Manila's harbor. The Japanese could fire at a lot of ships near Corregidor. I mean, sorry, could fire at a lot of ships. Well, yeah, they could fire at a lot of ships near Corregidor. And so the U.S. had to take Corregidor. So they did it they two ways, okay? Yeah, the 503rd Parachute Regiment that were going to parachute into a key hill called Topside. Okay, it was called Topside. And they took Topside. And then you had the 11th, not sorry, not the 11th, the 34th, the 3rd Battalion of the 34th Infantry Division that took a hill called Malenta Hill. And after they took, after the 503rd Parachute Regiment took Topside, and the 34th Infantry Division, third, the 3rd Battalion, 34th Infantry Division, they took Malenta Hill, they the airborne soldiers the infantry soldiers linked up okay and Corregidor also was home to a lot of American prisoners of war these American prisoners of war were prisoners of war from when the United States lost the Philippines to Japan uh, in early 1942 and these men fought bravely so many US citizens and US soldiers could get out so MacArthur really wanted to liberate Corregidor because he promised the Philippine citizens I shall return he said, I shall return, and he also promised those to the American soldiers who were captured. So God bless General MacArthur. And when he, when, when the Philippines were freed from Japan, um, he shook a lot of the soldiers' hands, the soldiers did the fighting, and he smiled. And a lot of the soldiers uh, had tears in their eyes, cause, and they thought they did a good job, because if you had a five-star general, MacArthur time was a five-star general, and he was smiling at you, that means you did a good job. So God bless the brave U.S. soldiers that liberated the Philippines from Japanese imperialism, and God bless the um, the Philippine the Filipino guerrillas. They're like the unsung heroes of World War II, who really helped the U.S. soldiers in their mission, and they also may uh, were a nuisance to the Japanese occupation forces during World War II. So, I've been to Japan many times. Japan now pours a lot of money into the Philippines economy. That was then. This is now. It's not an anti-Japan post at all. Um, and I have a good time when I go to Japan. This is not an anti-Japan post by any means. This is just to honor the soldiers who fought in the Battle of Luzon and to remember their legacy. So I hope everybody's doing well. Take care. God bless. And bye-bye. Oh, and if you want to know where the orange is coming from, here's my alma mater, Auburn University, War Eagle. I'm cheering on Auburn um, when they play Ole Miss uh, tomorrow. So go Auburn. So I hope everybody's doing well. Take care. God bless. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.